My name is Kim Motes, and I'm the Program Manager of the Performance Plus Program. And on behalf of the Kennedy Center, I'd like to welcome you to the Mary Lou Williams Women in Jazz Festival panel, The Business of Jazz, Creating Effective Publicity Tools. We're delighted to have with us this morning, uh, to my left, Linda Bramble, Director of Creative Music Publicity. Next to her, Dr. Billy Taylor, jazz musician, composer, educator, and the Kennedy Center's Artistic Advisor for Jazz. To my right is Susan Brunowitz, publicist for the Manhattan School of Music. Next to her is Nancy Ann Lee, jazz journalist, and Candy Shannon, program director and afternoon host for WDCU-FM. Please welcome our panel. Good morning. I should uh, start by saying I spent 12 years in commercial radio. And uh, uh, in doing that, uh, one of the things that I found was that uh, I got uh, terrible uh, materials from uh, people who I admired. I mean, people that, whose work I would have used if the material had been better. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean in terms of what, what it sounded like. But I mean a record that, that wasn't well pressed or, or a tape that uh, skipped or was, was badly done. Uh, you do yourself a lot of harm when you, when you uh, don't monitor the things you send out and make sure that whatever it is uh, is the best that you can possibly put out. Don't do something that was done in your basement because you want to hurry up and get it out. And, and, I mean, make sure that if it's done in your basement, it sounds as good as it, it, as, uh, it would if you had done it in the studio. You can do that with the. Uh, kind of uh, equipment we have these days. So uh, there are any number of ways that uh, uh, you can help yourself, and that's where it starts. I mean, before you can deal with any people on, on this panel, uh, you have to think about who am I, what am I trying to say, and to whom? I mean, you, you figure uh, uh, everyone who is a performing artist is really trying to get his or her thing out there and trying to get it uh, uh, it's like a conversation. I mean, if you tell a joke, you want people to laugh. You know, I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. not, uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, well, hey, I'm playing this great piano. I want somebody to respond to it, you know? And so uh, 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 these are things that consider, you need to consider uh, before you uh, uh, send anything out. Another consideration, and I'm just setting, hopefully, the tone for what we're going to say, uh, and then I'll shut up. The, uh, <laughs> uh, the, I don't know if you've been reading the paper. We've been here for three days. We've been here since Thursday. And there's been very little coverage of something that I think is a very special occasion and is newsworthy. Now, I don't blame the media for that. I, I think that that puts another, uh, puts another uh, um, weight on us. It means that we have to look, we have to be more inventive, more creative, because we're coming up against the uh, installation of the uh, uh, FDR memorial. We're coming up against. I mean, big news. I mean, stuff that, that, that they're going to report. So uh, unless we can convince them that women who are making a contribution to our culture through jazz uh, is an important thing to, to look at, uh, we're not going to get the paper. We're not going to get on television. You know? So uh, that is what we can discuss today. So having said that, um, why don't we start at this end and, and see uh, what uh, you have to say. I said a little about radio, but uh, why don't you pick up and give us some thoughts that you might have that, would be, that you feel would be helpful to uh, anyone who really wants to uh, begin to utilize uh, promotion and publicity uh, in the best way. Thanks. 
Once again, I'm Candy Shannon, and I've been in radio since the mid-70s. I've been in, uh, quote, media since 1973 out of college. I have been at public jazz radio since the fall of 94, and I'm program director, but I also host an afternoon program at a struggling public radio station that can also use good ideas on publicity. <laughs> uh, and, and publicity means people know you're there, which means they come out and see you, or they buy your product, basically. That, that, I think it's important to keep in mind why you're going after whatever publicity it is that uh, you want to get. And especially now, say, with the internet, there are so many paths to getting yourself known beyond your family and friends. There are just so many. So uh, if you're really just trying to get started and get into it, pick somewhere. Now, if you pick radio, I will assume that you have recorded material, whether your artist does or you do. Uh, at our radio station and at most public stations, and I'll even go far, so far as to say most uh, commercial stations, although the technology is moving, 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 and in commercial radio they may have money to do some other things. But it's, for instance, at our station, we can accept music to play on the air only on a compact disc right now, really. All right? Cassettes have never been really acceptable because a cassette quality, if most of your music is on a compact disc, and then I play oh, a reissue, one of Dr. Taylor's tunes, and then I play, go to a cassette, you will hear a difference in quality. And the difference won't be positive. You know, uh, when a radio station invests its money in equipment, it doesn't, uh, today in 1997, buy to play on the air top of the line uh, cassette players, primarily because what you buy in the music store isn't recorded on that kind of tape anyway. So. Prepare and with a compact disc. Be ready with a disc. Now, at our radio station, for instance, and we are a, a very small operation compared to many. We have uh, programmer hosts. We have a person who handles music, that is, music companies, um, music marketing firms send music to us, and we have boxes of them. <laughs> And uh, together with another person at the station, we'll look through it. We'll see some automatic ads. Dr. Taylor sends something in. We're going to put it in for everybody to play, OK? But you come, and I don't know you at all, although, frankly, I'll tell you, anytime we see a woman, uh, we go, oh, <laughs> what'd she do? <laughs> so uh, and, and that's something to know. And we can get to that. It, 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 that if it matters to some women, you might send it to women. You never know. People are people, and, and some people might say, I'm not going to do it just because, and other people say, I will because. So find out where you're sending your music if you're doing it yourself. But let me describe, go back to the process. Uh, if we pick up a, a, P, a CD, and we like independent productions as a public station that plays a lot of jazz. I've decided that one way to keep public radio, our station alive, and jazz alive is to make sure that the music is there as often as we can. So where I hear horror stories where the music is disappearing in places, unless we disappear entirely, it will be most of what we do at WDCU here in Washington, uh, unless the station disappears, and that's another state. So if I pick up something and there's, it's with, the photo means less, but information means most. I need, we want to know, if you just pick up anybody else's stuff and you'll see, you want to know who it is, who the players are, what they're playing, when it was recorded, uh, anything about it, where the studio where it was recorded, uh, information that we use and that we share with listeners. And if you are an independent, keep, have a phone number where you're, product is available, even if it's yours. Uh, I, I've got more I could say, but I want to spread it around and then come back to presentation. And uh, one thing I'll, st I'll st stop, I'll do this and stop. Uh, last week, a young woman came to the radio station during my air shift. She obviously knew that uh, I was program director as well as the, the, the 
person on the air at the time. And she came at a very busy time. I felt kind of badly, although when people don't make appointments, I've learned to stop feeling too badly about that. But she waited about 20 minutes. And she had three CDs that she had done and put together. She plays clarinet uh, in a little bag, a little bow and everything. And she waited and talked to me. And I talked to her a little bit about it when I had a chance. But you know, when I got off, I made a point to listen. And it's, it's she plays clarinet. That was different. <laughs> you don't hear a lot of jazz clarinet today anyway. So uh, it, it grabbed my ear. And I sat down and listened. And I'm sure we'll play some of it and, and give it give listeners a chance to make a decision. So taking the time to make a personal contact somewhere along the line is very important. Whether it's at your a radio station or at a club where you'd like to get a booking, I, I can't, but I think it's very important when you're trying to get that foot in the door, when you're trying to create something make a personal contact somewhere along the line and then keep in touch. And as in, in my case, um, Mama raised me to be polite and, and with folks anyway, so I'm going to do that. And I think it's probably true with most people. They may be busy, but you don't lose by calling back, by staying in touch. You try to put your feelings in your back pocket and don't worry about that. And just keep going. And, you know, try not to sound annoyed if they haven't listened yet. <laughs> but just keep going. It, you'll, you'll get there. You, you do. How many of you, first of all, are performers? Can I see a show of hands? OK, most of you. I'm going to make sure I address <laughs> my comments correctly. Um, Again, I'm Nancy Ann Lee, and I'm a freelance jazz journalist in, in, living in Cleveland. Um, I want to say, first of all, that, that actually radio and print media kind of work in tandem. Because if you, if you are trying to get publicity for your group or for yourself as an individual, um, you, you, if you have a product, which a CD or a recording, that you, you want to get it to the radio stations first, actually, because that kind of generates listener interest. And from there, then, you should be contacting the, the print media, someone like myself who, who could do a, a preview article if you're doing a special event of, say, say it's a newly released CD, perhaps, and you want, you're having a CD release party that editors like to hook uh, the news or the event or the feature article on on a, something that's happening, something that's current. So, I mean, if you're playing a same old, same old club gig, my editor isn't interested in that. I, I couldn't, I couldn't sell that article to any publication. So I need, I need a hook first of all to interest my editor. And one of the things um, that that helps, or well, the the kind of thinking that helps. Uh, uh, center on something novel or unique is to think about what hasn't been done. What, how, what ways could you promote yourself and, and to get publicity that, that somebody else hasn't done? And there are, at the grassroots level, there are a number of things to do. I mean, if you're looking for national attention, obviously it's more difficult. But I work mostly with people uh, in, in, in Cleveland. I do publicity for people and I've publicized uh, events for the Northeast Ohio Jazz Society. Um, but if you're looking for to get at least a foundation before you seek national attention, you sh certainly should get something in print in your own hometown. So um, there are ways to do that. And often, it, you may have to, your band may have to play free for an event that you know that your social uh, columnist is going to cover and you're going to get your name your band name in the paper and generate interest that way. Um, I work one day a week at the local musicians union, and I handle the referrals. We have a computerized referral base. So if you, if you are not a member of your union, you should look into that to see if, if they can help you uh, with re referrals, too. That's another way. Um, and and uh, that, that works very well. I mean, but. Like most of the calls we get are for weddings, so if you don't want to, do, <laughs> for weddings are private, private engagements, but are, they, they do pay. So if you're looking to make an income too, that's that's one way of doing it. But that's another way of getting your name 
out there, so don't necessarily uh, uh, turn those jobs down or, or look the other way. Um, uh, also, I, th I think that um, the way you interest a person like me, I mean, I'm very approachable. I mean, I have musicians call me uh, to tell me about an event they're doing. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, the first thing they ask me, okay, what's, what's unique about this? Why should I write about it? And that forces them to focus on, on why this, this event is, uh, is uh, important. For example, uh, a couple years ago, this 29-year-old uh, jazz musician started a label in Cleveland. Um, and he, he was putting out C, three CDs at that time of local musicians. Well, he got a lot of, a lot of coverage of that. I mean, Bobby Jackson at WCPN in Cleveland mm -hmm. was all over that and extremely supportive. And um, also, uh, I mean, they had, one of the CDs was kind of backed by, this, by the club that this, fellow had been playing at for years. I mean, you know, he approached them, again, thinking of novel ways to, to get support. He approached them and asked them if they would be willing to uh, support him to do this CD. And that's basically, I mean, and, and then that fell into, that CD got him um, advertising, it's, I guess, it, for Europa Eyewear, they have a jazz eyeline or something, a jazz <laughs> eyewear line, and and so Enjoy now smile. they buy somebody buys a pair of glasses and they get one of his CDs. Oh, I mean, you couldn't get that kind of distribution, um, you know. I mean, if you were calling up everybody across the country, so he really got lucky with that. So it's it's just the same as you said to to. to Pound on doors, make make uh, personal contacts, uh, talk to your local jazz journalists like my, myself, and uh, give us a give us a hook so that we can um, um, publicize your event and write about you. Susan, thank you. Um, my name is Susan Berlowitz, and I work at the Manhattan School of Music in New York City. Um, I am the publicist there. I. Um, relocated from Lincoln, Nebraska last June, and I began my job at Manhattan School of Music in August. I was brought in because I have uh, a wide background from radio and um, performing and a varied background. In addition, um, my expertise is in jazz. The Manhattan School of Music um, had never been able to get um, any of the jazz writers, reviewers uh, in New York City to come into the school right. to even do a review of one of their performances. Now, you can sigh on that one, but you have to realize how busy New York City is. Um, also, the person who had been doing all of the publicity for the school um, which amounts to a lot because we have a classical department as well as a jazz department. She is classically trained and excellent. Um, so her expertise was not in jazz to begin with. Um, the writers, reviewers, critics um, knew right away they would not go very far into a, a, a conversation and she wouldn't be able to follow them. Plus, there's 750 uh, young people in the classical department and 150 in the jazz department. The jazz department began in 1981. So I was given the small goal of <laughs> getting a jazz writer to come into the school. Um, so with that process in mind and that, that goal, just simply that goal in mind, first of all, I went into the press list. Now, I was lucky um, because of what I, my background, what I came from in Lincoln, Nebraska, I was already well connected um, in New York City. I had been lucky enough to spend a lot of time there. Um, so, uh, first of all, your press list is very, very important. Um, and develop that press list. Find out who your writers are, find out who your radio people are, um, find out who heads up foundations and people that are involved with those things 
that that um, might be interested in what you're doing that your press release might mean something to. Um, those are just a, a few things. I mean, like we could go on on that one for a long way, a long time. But your press list is very important. Then taking that press list and developing a press release for your event, your product, or whatever that might be. Um, your press release needs to be very organized, very organized and very clear. Um, jumbling it up with a lot of extra things um, will only confuse the person it's going to. The people that get your press releases get a lot of press releases. <laughs> if they can't pick out those details right away, um, you're going to not get very far. Um, also, most people um, in all areas of the country, the people who write, review, list, and do all of those things don't only deal with just jazz. They deal with everything. Um, so, so you really need to speak to them. Um, it's a process. And the process works, and I can tell you that it works because it has worked for the Manhattan School of Music. Um, your press release will do a variety of things for you. If you're beginning, it's going to give you listings. Your listings will build your audience. Your audience will get you attention from the radio and various other things, saying maybe you don't even have a CD or a recorded product. Um, your press release um, can uh, be used as a hook, uh, maybe on down the line a little while after you've established your audience and built your audience, then um, you, can, you can go even further with it, um, picking your words, choosing your words. Um, I, I can't stress that enough as something that uh, is going to pique their interest and make them want to write it down. If you can come up with a sentence that they can pick right out and put right into their listing, um, <coughs> that will help them also. Your press release is also going to include whatever relative bios, biographies of the leader of the, the group um, and all of the people inside the group. I think that's very, very important. These bios need to be um, very concise for this particular um, piece of information. Um, it's good to have a two-page bio. It's good to have a two-paragraph bio. Um, mm -hmm. The best that I have ever worked with was David Haydu, who wrote the uh, Billy Strayhorn book. Mm. Um, he had every type of bio, of course he's a writer, but he had every type of bio. When he called me, he said, well, do you want two pages? Do you want a page? Do you want two paragraphs? I even have two sentences. <laughs> yeah, all right. I mean, he was a dream to work with on one of the events that I was lucky enough to be able to work with, on, with him. But um, I, I, I think the press release is a, a very, very important piece of information for for you and, and for who you're trying to reach. Um, if, uh, if, if you don't know how to put together a press release, I would suggest going out and, 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 I don't know, taking a class or a seminar or going to your musicians union and saying, um, can we put together a seminar on successful publicity like Mr. Taylor has done for the, the Smithsonian here um, and getting something actively going because I, I view that as something um, that uh, we aren't doing real well sometimes. Um, also, I thought Mary Johnson's um, What to Put in a Press Kit is excellent, excellent. Um, and, and information that is uh, very important for all of us. Um, 
so that was something specifically that I wanted to talk about. Um, and, and it has worked. I have gotten for the school, I've had the product also at some points in time. So I've been lucky enough the school has taken some of my ideas and let me produce them from start to finish. And they have worked, but we have had two major stories since September, and we have had four reviews. And um, the, the process, if you just follow it, works. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to note that in the, uh, at the Manhattan School, uh, the woman who used to be responsible for the uh, uh, booking talent here at the uh, Kennedy Center is the president there. And she's very uh, um, um, knowledgeable about everything in the classical field. I mean, she's lived that. And so everybody there, traditionally in Manhattan School, has been very classically uh, oriented to European classical music. Uh, Max Roach tells a story when Manhattan School was in another location of uh, uh, enrolling in the school when he was playing with Charlie Parker. And uh, he wanted to be, he wanted to study drums because the percussion teacher was excellent. But he went to the percussion uh, uh, class and uh, uh, the teacher said, well, you're holding your sticks wrong. <laughs> we have to change all of that. <laughs> so Max he said, Roach. well, the holding the sticks like this is paying my way through this school, so. <laughs> <laughs> So I think I better re uh, rethink this. So he became, Max Rose became a, a comp composition major. And so one of the, one of the reasons he, he organizes his music so well is that he studied composition and, and got his degree uh, in co as a composition major and uh, percussion and he did all that. Never changed the way he held his <laughs> But <laughs> So the, the school that, that she's, she's doing press for has, a, has a, that was back in, in the late 40s. So they, they, they haven't changed very much, but uh, so you can see what coming into a situation like that, her job was, uh, her work was cut out for her in, in right. terms of beginning in the school before you even go to the press. You've got to start with the school and do certain things. Exactly. And I do have uh, some handouts that I put together, examples of press releases, um, important things to think about when you're doing a press release. If you would like to see me afterwards, I'd be happy to share any of the uh, information that I have with you. Linda? Hi, I'm Linda Bramble. I head up my own music publicity firm in New York City um, with concentration on jazz musicians. Dr. Taylor is my client. And um, I also represent some others that you may be familiar with, Monty Alexander, um, Kevin Mahogany. <laughs> what do you like? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe and, and also um, a, a, a number of, of artists who, who are not as well known. Um, in any case, um, I thought a long time about what to, to bring to the table today. And I think that what we're lacking is, is good, solid, useful tools, information that can translate into results for us. And one of the first things that um, came to mind was to be resourceful. And by that, I mean, whatever your location is, wherever you live, if you live in a suburb or if you live in a large uh, major city, become familiar with the local daily newspapers. Become familiar with the weeklies that may focus on entertainment. Become familiar with the freebies that are handed out at the, the drugstore or your, or your neighborhood grocery store. And Read, read through them, become familiar with the names that you see on a regular basis. These will be the people that you want to communicate with. Um, and after you become familiar, then I would suggest trying to tailor your story, what you're trying to pitch to these editors and writers. Try to entice them with some kind of hook. Going back to, to what my colleagues were saying, um, there, just because you're appearing at a, at a club somewhere is not enough reason in and of itself for anybody to, to write about it because you're competing with so many others who are doing the same thing. Just as this festival is competing with the FDR statue, um, you're always going to be in competition with some other event and, and artists. Um, sometimes you luck out, 
and sometimes you don't. So it's always a good idea to be as imaginative and resourceful as you can when you contact people who do the writing and the preview pieces and the reviews. Um, that comes under the heading of doing your homework. And uh, the other thing that I've found that has helped me in my career has been to, um, to be observant, be especially observant. And by that I mean um, when you're watching your local uh, weekend Today show um, that airs on, on one of the uh, affiliates, the Today Show in New York City has a, a weekend today and it focuses on New York people. Just as they had this morning, I was watching the local Washington uh, program. Um, you never know whose name is going to pop up as the producer of a show. It may be somebody that you went to school with. It might be somebody that you knew hundreds of years ago. Um, it's very important to pay attention. And, and if you want to get yourself on television, if you're pitching yourself to a producer, to be on a show to promote a gig, then make sure that you're prepared to talk about it and make sure that your materials are in order. We'll talk a little bit more about materials um, specifically uh, later on. Another thing that I want to bring up is um, try to be realistic in your expectations. Um, don't ask for the moon when what you really want is the stars. Um, if, you know, if you're at a venue, as I said, and, and you're playing, and you know, you've been there before maybe, and there's, there's some other people coming through town who um, are more well known and they're more into the mainstream, you're up against something right off, uh, off the bat. Um, so knowing that, being aware, and again, that means you know, checking the listings and making sure that you know what your competition is for any given date or weekend or night. Um, know, know what that is, know what your competition is, and then pick out the, the authors or the critics or the DJs that you have a rapport with because you have been busily making yourselves familiar to these people um, and say, hey, you know, I know it's really a busy time, I know so-and-so's in town, but could you manage to, you know, just put in that, you know, I've got, I've got this horn player coming down and he never plays in this area. And I really think that that's an important part of, of what I have to offer at my gig tonight. So, you know, could you, could you maybe include that? <coughs> Be specific. And um, also, we need to consider how much there is out there in the marketplace. There are just so many magazines so many newspapers, so many books. We are inundated, all of us. We were having a, a conversation briefly in yesterday's panel about how many CDs are reviewed in any given month. And uh, I think it was up to 180,000, right? For, uh, and every, every month it advances another 10,000. So knowing that, <laughs> you can't take it personally if your CD doesn't get the attention that uh, a mainstream artist does, um, in a national publication especially. But um, you, you need to, again, be creative. Go to your local library. Go to your Barnes & Noble or your Borders bookstores and look through all of the magazines there. I'm not talking just about the music magazines talking about the women's magazines. I'm talking about uh, if you have a very interesting website, and, and we can get into that a little bit later too, you know, go to your computer magazines. Um, be creative. Notice what's on the stands. Pick up the magazine. Notice whose name is on the masthead. You might know somebody there. You might not. But at least you're aware of the publication. Become familiar with it and figure out a way to get your story heard by that publication. Oh. Sometimes singers especially are guilty of this, and, and I'm sure that Candy has come up against this as well. Um, you'll send out a tape or a CD, but there's all these qualifiers on it. Oh, 
I, and don't don't listen to the second cut because uh, you know the sounds bad on that or you know like I'm not really happy with with this song so just don't pay attention I don't really sound like that if you don't have a product that you're 100 percent happy with don't send it out because as Candy said there are just so many um, CDs and tapes that are received every day. Um, people are not going to take the time, and they really can't take the time to adhere to your very specific uh, whims, as it were. <laughs> um, so just you know, be ready, be prepared. If you're happy with what you have and you feel confident and secure, and you know that you've got a, a very well-produced product and it represents your talent well, and just go ahead, don't make excuses for it. Okay. One of the things that I think everybody is saying uh, is that uh, publicity starts with the person who wants to be publicized or the group that uh, needs the publicity. So first of all, you have to decide what it is you want publicized. You, you, what, what, what are you selling? What, what is the thing you're trying to communicate? Uh, and really organize that in the best way you can. Uh, you think about that when you perform. I mean, you just don't go out and say, well, this is the way I did it in rehearsal. I mean, you, 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 you consider the audience. I'm doing this for an audience and so forth. And, and you make uh, overtures to, to that audience. Um, one of the things I can say from personal experience, uh, uh, I had a very successful career and worked for a very long time without a record. Now, people in the business will tell you that's the impossible. It is not impossible. Uh, one of the reasons that I was able to do that is that I was interested in alternate spaces. I mean, in addition, I realized a long time ago that I spent uh, most of my uh, uh, early adult life in nightclubs. And I realized that nightclubs were pricing themselves out of the business. And uh, so whereas I could go in in the early days when I played opposite Mary Lou Williams and stay for a month in places, you can't stay for two days in a place now, <laughs> you know? And so uh, uh, you don't have time. Uh, I used to be able to go into a club and, and build an audience. The guy, I'd stay there for a month. So if he didn't do business the first week, I got paid. Everything was fine. But I had three more weeks to work. And so by the time we got to the third or fourth week, he was doing all right. He made enough money to cover the, the losses of the first couple of weeks. They don't do that anymore. So what you've got to figure is how do I get people uh, in seats in, so, so that they can hear what I do? Uh, if you look at the alternate uh, uh, places, and for now, we have to uh, back, uh, put on the back burner the uh, places where we used to go for money. The NEA uh, is non-existent as far as, as individual artists are concerned. Uh, many of the other uh, programs uh, that formerly gave money to uh, people in small groups are uh, only places like Kennedy Center and large groups are getting the money now. I mean, that's the way it is. So instead of griping about that, let's see where else we can look. Uh, so where I think we need to look uh, is just something that was mentioned with the eyeglasses. Uh, we need to that's look right. into uh, the people that uh, we can reach out and touch and say, I think I can do something for your particular project. Let me give you an example. Uh, in every place in the downtown area, there are spaces where people have lunch. Now, in uh, 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 New York, one of the things that we did was to uh, uh, talk to people who were in the midtown area around the Rockefeller Center. They got a lot of places where people come out of the buildings, and especially when the weather is nice, and have lunch and sit and smoke or do whatever they're going to do. Okay, uh, we talked to a couple of Exxon and a couple of other uh, people who had offices in the building. So well, you got your employees here. Uh, why don't you uh, hire? Uh, this group because it's a good group and, and the people will like it and you know and we'll put your name up and say you're the good guys that presented uh, this and uh, 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 we actually hit them up with some money so that we could pay the groups and and so uh, it wasn't uh, uh, it wasn't a big deal I mean it wasn't uh, um, the, the greatest uh, kind of gig but a the musicians did get paid B, they got all kinds of exposure because you don't know who's walking by in the street or who's, who, who's there. And it was an extension of what we do at, at Jazzmobile. And uh, uh, it worked very well, so well, that uh, some people uh, near the public library got a whole group of people and put, put on regular uh, sessions, which ultimately became a part of the uh, George Ween's uh, festival. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was such a great space that they said, hey, that's great, let's use that. But it started 
with, 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 with people who just went to the businesses in the area and said, uh, you know, we've got the library. They, they, they don't mind us using this, this uh, uh, public park, which adjo adjoins the public library. So, uh, you know, we'll put your, your name on the banner, or you can put it up because you've got the money. But uh, you can, uh, you know, we'll put it up there, and everybody will know that, that uh, you know, you're a good corporate citizen and blah, 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 blah. And, Everybody, uh, especially cigarette companies and beer companies and folks like that, need to have people think they're the good guys because they're catching a, catch a lot of hell now. So, <laughs> so, so, so uh, you go to guys like that. Uh, you go to uh, uh, another uh, uh, source. And there was uh, some seasons ago, uh, um, New York in its wisdom cut out all the arts in the schools and said, you know, we, we don't need that. Uh, one teacher that I know, others probably did it, but one teacher in particular, uh, um, whose name was Javaris. Uh, she was a violin teacher, and she was furious. She said, uh, I, it, it is in, unconscionable for this, the, the people of New York to do this to, to minority children. Uh, she taught in Spanish Harlem. And she said, to say that these kids can't play the violin is ludicrous. And uh, they're, they're working, they're working hard. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make sure I, that they, they stay here. So she, she canvassed personally. The neighborhood went to shoemakers and, and, and hairdressing parlors and all kinds of things. She said, these are your kids. Now, I want you to put up some money to pay for the program. I don't want to leave. She said, I'm violent. I can go work. I mean, I don't have to, you know, I'm making a lot less money uh, working here than I would if I were teaching privately or doing other things. I love these children. I want to do something for them. And so she, she uh, convinced the, 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 the uh, businesses that they should support uh, uh, that program. It was the only, then, she had to turn around and convince the, the stupid people in the, in the school board that she could use this, the, could, could continue to use the, the school because they were giving her a hard time. Well, she got the parents up in, in arms about that. They helped her do that. Yeah. So anyway, uh, to make a long story short, her program was so good that uh, the second violinist with the Guarneri Quartet, Michael Tree, came up and looked at it, went and got his friend uh, Isaac Stern and said, I, I, come up here and look at, look at, look at these, these uh, 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 kids. He came up, and Isaac Stern said, wow, yeah, OK. He went back to Carnegie Hall, uh, arranged for a date, got eight of the, it's like Perlman, eight of the, the uh, best violinists in the world. They did a benefit for the school. So I mean, the thing kind of snowballed, but it all started mm -hmm. with this, this, this woman who decided that uh, uh, I'm going to these nickel and dime places. I'm going to get $5 here and $6 there mm -hmm. and, and, and support my program. You have to think like that, what works for you as an individual. Everybody who uh, is good enough to get up and hold people's attention as an entertainer has somebody who is supportive. So you've got a base, no matter who you are. You've got family, friends, whatever. Uh, you can mobilize them. I mean, they can be the ones that call up uh, the radio stations and say, well, hey, this, uh, this is the greatest flautist in the world. I mean, you, why aren't you playing her records? I mean, she's dynamite. You know, she's, uh, here, uh, I'm going to send you the record. Please play it. You know? And, and, and uh, when you do things like that, uh, anyone I know from, from, from my own radio experience, uh, if I got one call, okay, that's, that's nice. I got five calls, say, hey, yeah, well, let me take another listen to that record, you know, because uh, maybe I missed something, you know. It may have been just uh, uh, that woman's fan club calling me, but fine, at least they got my attention, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, what the point I'm making, and I think uh, what we need to discuss, and I'll take uh, whatever questions you have, unless you have some more to add from the, the panel. Uh, uh, the, the idea is to be resourceful yourself, to, to start with the thing that puts what you have to say in the terms that you want out there. I mean, you think it through, so you just don't do what Linda was saying, don't play track two, or, or, or don't look at this picture, this is, this is not a good one, look at the other one, I mean, I got them both on the same page. <laughs> and, 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 uh, uh, People do that because you know they think you have really more time than you have. You must realize that that uh, anybody who is going to do you any good uh, is getting so much information that your information is coming in a big pile. Now you want yours to sit out from the pile, so you have to make sure that it's concise and that it says what you want it to say and it puts your best foot forward. Questions? Hi, can I ask yes. something? Nobody, nobody has mentioned timeliness. I mean, yeah. if you have an event coming up, uh, as a print journalist, I need uh, your information two months, two to three months ahead of yeah. time for magazines, and at least 
three weeks, the minimum of, of three weeks ahead for, for uh, newspapers, weekly newspapers, or daily newspapers, because I need to pitch my editors and they have to allocate space in their publications for this. So if you, you know, if you are sending me a, a press release a week before the gig, it just goes into the wastebasket. Right. I mean, I do, I, I, there's no way that I can do anything with it. But, but realistically, a lot of people who are working on a, uh, an ad hoc level don't have, they're not booked a month no. ahead of time. It's so, 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 uh, <laughs> on the occasions when you can, you have to do that. Right. But, but we have to, to, to devise ways for the occasions when the gig just came up this week and you need it even more desperately than you would if it come up, had come up two, two months ago. Yes. And That's when I radio think. becomes important. <laughs> yeah. Personal yeah. contest. That's when. If you know Nancy, that's going to make a difference because sure. she's going to take the time out of her day, probably, as I would, to call who I know who I think would be interesting right. from right. my list. Mm -hmm. Because if I believe in that person, I will help them. Same way with Candy, I'm sure. If if uh, you were doing a gig and you didn't have the lead time that you needed, and you knew Candy, you would say, "Help me, please." You know, maybe she could arrange even for an on-air interview mm -hmm. promoting the place and the gig. Find out if the establishment that you're, <coughs> you're working at has someone that does publicity or not right up front. Some places do, a lot don't. But when you go in, don't just assume that that place that you got your gig at is going to publicize you and your event. Most places don't have that much sense. They don't. That's they don't, exactly they, don't right. they, they really, they really think. Well, I hired it's artist, true. artist A. And therefore, everybody's going to come. Right. You know, right. They, or, how, how are they going to know? You know. What about ticket giveaways too uh, yeah. on radio? Oh, sure. Right. Um, maybe Candy, Candy can Candy speak to in. that. Sure. Uh, I'll describe how we operate these days at WDCU and. Uh, but preface it by saying that listening and, and thinking about things that I have responded to or the station has responded to from non-nationally known pred mm -hmm. pedigreed jazz artists, because that's, we're talking about that break, that get your foot in the door kind of thing. It often does come from something that seems to reflect a passion of the artist somehow. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I could say, don't be afraid of that kind of thing especially as you get going, that when you believe in something, say for instance, you're part of a Jazz Vesper series at a church that you mm -hmm. attend, or um, you, you have the forethought to, to say, I want to get involved with a particular group so that when the benefit comes up next year, I'm doing benefits for, uh, for AIDS or for breast cancer or for education, and I, of course, uh, I, we're licensed to a university, but I also feel strongly that musicians who are willing to help students learn more about the music are doing themselves a favor and America a favor anyway. So I would recommend if you have the ability to get involved in a school system, in, in jazz in a school program, these kinds of things first keep you busy, keep you making contacts, but also can create a timely event that you can plan for for the next year, can create perhaps a concert that you'll be able to get the funding for, to get somebody to record it, to put it out on CD. That's a limited run, only available as a benefit, perhaps, for, for, the, uh, for the public service program of some kind. But these kinds of, and, and it doesn't mean that you're locked for the rest of your career there. But if it's something you believe in, it'll be something that will open door, and the next door will open, and the next door. These kinds of things are the things that often catch the attention of the cynical, harried, busy people who are the gatekeepers, who are the ones saying yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> now, how we keep the gate at J WDCU Jazz 90? Uh, we are in public radio struggling for our lives also. So we, I'm interested, you know, as I listen to this kind of thing, first of all, for whatever stupid reason, jazz, jazz, is, is struggling around the country on a, on a radio, on radio. And the great big entertainment business 
I've heard people say, well, you know, jazz re CDs are tax write-offs for major companies. Well, in this environment, it, what that means is even if you're signed to Verve or RCA or Polygram or Warner Brothers, those companies may not put the resources behind your project that they're going to put behind Prince or Snoop Doggy Dog or whoever else because they aren't looking to really make money. They do this because it is, makes business sense somehow. So for jazz artists, don't ever think you're going to make that, get that advance unless it's your company. And that's another thing that mo many jazz artists end up doing, you realize, mm -hmm. is start their own labels because they can't get the kind of commitment by turning it over to a major label. But, uh, so the process that we're talking about today of developing your, your sense of your own publicity, this is important because you're not probably going to be as successful getting that support from A&R people, et cetera, even should you make a major uh, label deal. Learn it yourself. It, I would suggest that, and I've talked to plenty of musicians in all forms of music who say the artist who knows his or her business has a career. Mm -hmm. The artist who goes, oh, take care of it for me, you know, oh, I, could have a big problem someday. Okay. But at any rate, uh, prod, linking your project to an event, part of linking yourself to something, something else or other musicians, there are all kinds of creative ways I know you could think of, builds your base. You know, there are other people who want to support you beyond the fact they may not. There are people, believe it or not, who don't, who say, I don't understand jazz. But they're nice people, and you get to know them. Next thing you know, well, they don't, un but they understand your music, and this kind of thing keeps going. I think one of the assets of what we're talking about, jazz and women in jazz, is that we're talking about people with talent. There are people out here who make records or recordings who aren't that talented, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> you know. So I b am firmly believe that the work that you've given to your art, if you can find, spin off some time to give it to the business side of it, will put you ahead of, of, of the game because there are plenty of people in the big pop industry who make music, who you don't, who your kids couldn't tell you really what they're doing today. But we're kind of talking about a long-term career, I'm sure, for people who want to, who, who, whether it's recording or performing or educating, this is something you want to do for the rest of your lives, probably. So starting in your, in, your, in your community and making the contacts with the writers for the newspaper, with the radio stations, with the club owners, with other musicians, create a festival, back a, back a prop, back a cause, all these kinds of things. First of all, make contacts for you, give you work experience. I know working for free, I know jazz musicians work for free a lot. <laughs> and I know you probably go, again, not, but those, don't be afraid to ask to get paid. You, you know, that sometimes is when you value what you do, other people are forced to value it also. So don't sell yourself too short. Value your, even if you give it for free, value it and deduct it, <laughs> you know, from your income tax. Consider it something. Now, oh, and, and, but I wanted to say about at a radio station, if you're not from here, identify and you find a radio station in your area that does play jazz and we're talking, bless its heart, Smooth jazz, if you're on that kind of thing, uh, that's a whole nother, I can talk about that. If you want to go in that direction, that is another hard, difficult one, but you don't get there by go contacting the radio station very well. That, that's a, going to be a harder thing. But at a public station or at a, at a station that plays jazz, find out do they, do they play new music? Do they play unknown artists? And if they go, if you kind of get a kind of, uh, Lobby for it. Keep calling back. Maybe you find somebody who says, or you're willing to do an hour, and you want to play yours and other people. You know, help them hear why it's important. And it's important because as much as we love those that have gone before, if uh, jazz has to be a vital, growing, breathing, living art, and it is important to keep giving people an opportunity to be heard. And you gotta let them know that. Find ways to let people know that. Because there are those who go, oh, you know, if it isn't Charlie Parker, it's not jazz. Or <laughs> if it isn't Cal Basie, it's not jazz. And you have, you're just gonna have to keep on pushing through that, 
find a way, new jazz at the Art Institute, uh, playing live for lunch so that people ask for you. And um, what you work, one creative way that I, that uh, Nancy, Nancy spoke about was not only when that uh, guy had the CD backed by the iCompany, Company, but you might think about somebody backing a compilation CD of live performances over yeah, the summer or something. Yeah, they've done that in Cleveland. You know, not for yeah. jazz, but, but you know, for we, other kinds we've of got things. The rock and roll hall of fame, so. Yeah. So, <laughs> so those yeah. kind. Of, there are but, labels that started out as foundations strictly. I mean, there's one out of Pittsburgh now. The um, that did the that won a Grammy. The uh, Count Basie Manchester, Orchestra at Manchester right? Craftsman's Guild yeah. won a Grammy for that album, which that was the second one. There's the Mama Foundation out in California that's recording a lot. Of, mm -hmm. So think beyond, as you probably do anyway. Uh, the the typical pop. Uh, R and B, uh, rock and roll, route into recording if that's what you're looking to do. And I think this music is performed live, which is an advantage I think it has over uh, what is done in studios. You know, people go to the stu buy the CD, and then when they go hear them live, they go, "But that's not the same thing." I don't. You, know, you have to put it on a on a personal basis, though, because I, I, I think uh, the thing that everyone here who raised his, or her hand or his hand. Uh, um, well, how do I do for me uh, the things that you're talking about? And I think that's what we're trying to address. And I, uh, one way to get into that is that you, as an individual, have to decide uh, uh, what you're trying to say. Be as concise as you can. And, and, uh, but you have to look at uh, uh, placing a value on what you do. And uh, I've done enough benefits for everybody in the room, so I can tell you about playing for free. Uh, there, there is, uh, uh, you have to get to the place where you can afford to play for free. Because uh, uh, when, you, when you give away, you can pay all the benefits in the world, they may not uh, 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 develop into jobs. That's right. And, and uh, so you have to uh, pick your shots. You have to really look at, uh, um, identify the audience that you're going for. The problem with jazz is that we, as a group, don't, uh, our fan base, we don't, uh, those of us who are artists, and everybody has fans, uh, uh, we don't really uh, bring our fans together in the way that hip hop kids do, or in the way that, that R&B people do, the way that uh, uh, people who play in the Hispanic tradition do. We have to look at how they do what they do and see how that applies to us. It works. Country and Western uh, groups work. I mean, uh, a lot of those, those, those people, uh, print the Country and Western, for instance, and, and, and hip hop, uh, uh, they do put out their own records. Put them in the trunk, take them to the gig, That's sell right. them. Now, uh, it costs you, uh, we'll say, a couple of thousand dollars to do uh, the uh, uh, CD that, that you want. OK. Uh, uh, you can get whatever your investment is back uh, uh, by by taking it to the gig and selling it for the, for the going price of, of, of you're selling it for the same thing that that uh, uh, Warner or somebody else you're not uh, 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 they they put that high price it only costs about a, what a dollar or something 50. for a dollar yeah. fifty for per CD so you make that profit there and you get your music in the way that 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 uh, you know. Uh, uh, the, yesterday, I introduced uh, um, a gentleman, Andrew White, who has done that perhaps better than anybody I know. And he told you he made a lot of money. Andrew, do you have any thoughts uh, about the individuality in that regard? Yeah, yeah better than that, though, I, had, I wanted to dovetail what Candy was saying and ask uh, how important the playlist is in radio as well as in the, in the other fields that you're representing. Do you have the equivalent of playlists? Uh, and I, I'll speak as a record executive here. Um, playlists were very important to record companies. Uh, I'm on the other end of the stick. 99.3 uh, quarters percent of my business is incoming calls only. So the radio stations call me. I don't call anybody. They've called me for records. And the first thing I ask is, do you have a playlist? And if they say yes, I say, please send me three playlists dating back nine months. So that will help me understand what type of product I can send them that can best represent me according to what they've been playing. But the vast majority of public stations and many small stations do not publish playlists. So how 
uh, how can the, ra the, the radio stations service the recording industry if they have no policy of what they're playing and, and sort of inspire the, the record companies to invest in the airplay? Or is it simply that there's so many records out there that they don't need to, to think that way? But as a record company president, I have to, I really, I've really been concerned about that because, I'm, like I said, yesterday I made a lot of money, but I made a lot of money from AirPlay because of the playlist system. That is an excellent question. In commercial, <laughs> <laughs> see, in commercial radio, um, they have a playlist because they have a limited list that they play. And the whole system is set up that way. In other words, a, a radio station gets music because we play the music. The, ra the record companies don't invest sending music places that isn't going to play it. They try not to. And the quid pro quo is, I send you the music, you play it, you prove it. And in the commercial realm, they have a lot of ways. They have something called sound scan, which does these independent scans of radio stations. They have uh, ra radio stations report to trade magazines like Billboard, etc. how many times, how, where they play it heavy, medium, light. And they publish uh, a playlist that says these are the top 18 songs in a row for this week. Uh, I come from commercial radio, and when I arrived at the station where I am now, everybody's a host programmer, and there's no, there was no playlist, no way to do that. And, but what our station does do is report to a trade magazine. And so um, if we say, if, if, they, if Verve sends us music, and then we report, oh, we're playing Doc Cheatham, and we're playing Abby Lincoln, we're playing uh, uh, Mark Whitfield, then Verve keeps sending us music. Now, we do play them, uh, and that's where our radio station's integrity needs to be uh, clear. But what you can ask, and what I have established at Jazz 90, and we keep working because they're working with folks who don't want, is that you've got to write down what you play. And therefore, if you ask someone, get your representative, to send you copies of whatever distance of time so you can get an idea, did they, anybody ever play my music? <laughs> Or, or that kind of thing. You can get an idea of what kind of music they play and uh, find out if they're a reporting station. Then if they are, for instance, there are uh, now marketing firms that do a lot of independent production marketing. And so instead of you, you have a CD, I don't know how it works, but apparently you can probably sign a contract with Dr. Neal or uh, Gorov Marketing or these other places who will do the job of trying to market your disc to radio stations. And they make these calls and say, we want to add this week. And that ad is reported to Gavin. And then it shows up on a Gavin list if they get enough ads at different radio stations. So that's, that's how that works. Well, now, when you, when you, you say you report uh, what you play, but do you report the frequency with which you play? Because that's what really helps to sell the Right, idea. that's what. That's what the heavy, medium, light designation yeah. means. You do that? They, yes. Okay. Do. Mm -hmm. There's something similar in, in, in print media. I mean, uh, in order to get a, a coverage for your a CD in print media, many national publications, for example, Jazz Times, you have to have national distribution. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if, if you don't have national distribution or distribution channels set up, you won't get a review in Jazz Times or Downbeat or any of the big magazines like that. I mean, you just, you'll have to rely on either local or regional press and then kind of build on it. But you, distribution is for your CDs is one of the hardest things to get. And, and uh, I, I myself kind of consider myself a champion of the small independent labels. <laughs> so I don't, but the stuff that I review for Jazz Times is sent to me by the publication to review. So that's, you know. And quickly, if we do do, Jazz 90 presents another compact discovery on our station. And that once a week, we play an independent production that someone who's not been released by a major label. And that disc will play at least three times, the entire disc. And uh, some, some are, and, and I've noticed, now we make a decision, we don't play everything, just because it, some of the things are either not going to be available at all, and that would stop me. If something is totally not going to be available to people, because people will send us a master, you know, the gold one, mm. sort of, 
because they want it played. Now, we may play it on occasion, and, and, and we will tell people it's, if it's a local artist. And we'll tell people, this is what they're doing. No, it's not. You can't buy it. You can hear it right here. <laughs> but if uh, I've been getting stuff from Philadelphia, from, the, from Connecticut, people I don't know, so we listen. Guy sent me something from Kansas City, but it was pretty good. Um, and if it fits what we play, there are things we don't play. Um, it, it, and that's a range, because we do play a range from the avant-garde, but we don't go too contemporary at all, because there are plenty of other places for that right now. Um, and that's something you might encourage, you know, on a, at a local radio station. Why don't you play local artists at least once a week? <laughs> yes. I'm the music director at 90.5 WDUQ in Pittsburgh. Uh, and one, two things. Jazz is changing around the country, so every station is going to approach the music differently. So what Candy is saying is working in D.C. might not work at WBGO in Newark, might not work out in um, KPLU. KPLU in Tacoma, or even KLON in uh, Long Beach, California. So you have to be aware that every station has to deal with its demographics and the assault that's on public radio. Uh, can I just respond to something? Sure. If that's okay. Uh, the other thing is, we said a CD. Some stations can handle DATs. At DUQ, we can handle CDs as well as DATs. If you send a DAT, it needs to be clearly labeled, times, everything. And if you're doing your own CD, please list the song, list the composer, ASCAP, BMI, and please proofread and give times. That's the biggest turnoff. And number it. That's the biggest turnoff to anybody. If you're working with a CD, do I have to sit down and count? This is number one, number, you know, you did Lush Life. Okay, this, that's cut number four. And every time, you know, I have to take it out of the disc and number it by hand and say, okay, cut number four, there's no time. Now I've got to put it back in and time it. That's a turnoff right there to anybody who's receiving 60, 70 CDs. I mean, I have tomorrow, Monday off. So when I go back in, there's going to probably be at least 10 CDs for me to open. So that's the other thing. You're dealing with people who have so much product. Um, Look at your region. If you're in Washington, D.C., why not send it to Philly? Why not send it to Baltimore? Why not Virginia? Consider expanding your region and your horizons. And you can easily contact National Public Radio or um, your local radio station. The library has a ton of information. Use your local library as a resource. Uh, in Pittsburgh, the Carnegie Library in Oakland has a major music department. It's a major reference section. I use it. They have a foundation department that tells you how to reach foundations. And uh, if you're doing something very special, see if the radio station can be a media sponsor for what you're doing. And uh, the other thing is, as a musician, save the nickels and dimes. When it's a pledge time, call in and have your name read on the air as calling in a pledge. Yeah. That is the biggest way. Yes, it is. Because most musicians don't do it. Yeah. That's right. And we've had musicians challenge other musicians. And, you know, for the next two hours, you know, uh, so-and-so whose gig is such-and-such. Such. So that's another way of getting your name out there. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in Pittsburgh, we have a lot of guys doing a program called Jazz for Juniors. Now, women know kids. <laughs> <laughs> no women are doing it. Well, we don't. Well, that's another story in Pittsburgh. But if does anybody here remember Mr. Rogers? Neighborhood? Sure. Handyman Negri. Joe Negri does jazz for juniors, and uh, you know that's the big thing. And all the kids go Handyman Negri, woo! And you know they just woo! And some of the parents are going woo, going along with their kids. Uh, think about creating jobs for yourselves. We've been talking about Barnes and Noble, Borders. They have music sessions. Whether you want to like review a book for them or review jazz books or review um, CDs or come in and do a presentation. A lot of these places have music on certain nights. Think about that. Uh, I'm in charge of Jazz Vespers, the only ecumenical jazz vesper service in Pittsburgh. I'm the advisor for it. Where is it? At Emmanuel Episcopal Church, one of four churches designed by H.H. H. Richardson. So right. it's historical, 111 years old. Right. And we've been doing jazz for eight years. And um, it's, it's taking off. And a lot of, we're finding a lot of people are coming to the music because they like that balance 
of spirituality as well as the um, warmth of the music and uh, working with that. Uh, museums have programs during the summer. They're always looking for people. Libraries have programs and presentations. In Pittsburgh, our annual library has an annual gala. We do tons of information telling who's going to play. See if you can do things like that. The other thing is know how to do an interview. Do dry runs. The worst thing is, especially if you're doing a phoner, have somebody sit down, somebody like Nancy, who I knew from when I was in Cleveland, uh, she would put me through my paces. I'd say, Nancy, help! <laughs> and she would ask these questions. I'm like, why are you asking me that? But if she could figure it out, that meant somebody somewhere down along the line would ask it. And that's what you have to do. You have to be prepared to think on your feet or on your seat. And one of the best ways, and I've had many people say, I came to hear the gig because I like what that person said during your interview. They sounded interesting. I wanted to see what they looked like. I wanted to hear them. The music was OK, but sometimes they're better live. So know how to do interviews, not only for TV. You know, Have somebody who can do makeup for you if you get that. Um, you know, those little programs, they run at either 3 in the morning or um, midnight or 6 in the morning for women and for minorities. They're always at weird times. That's another way to get exposure. But again, have a hook for those. Um, what are the minority newspapers or women's newspapers in your community? Do they take information about upcoming events? Can you put, you know, if you know about something coming up, can you put that in? And uh, I just want to say this panel's been great, and I've learned a lot too, but I just hope some of that will help some of you as well. One, one other thing uh, in addition to what you're saying uh, about interviews. Um, I interview a lot of people. And I'm also interviewed. So you might profit by something that I do when I'm being interviewed. If the interview is not going the way I want, I take, it, take over. That's right. And, and so uh, uh, someone asked me a question, and I want to talk about my new album. He says, uh, well, where were you born? I said, well, um, you know, my new album is, uh, uh, before I tell you where I was born, my new album is, you know, and, and uh, oh, yeah, and by the way, I, you know, uh, but, but you answer, say what you, you know, keep in mind, this is why I'm here. Because uh, you, especially if you're on the radio, uh, people will ask you very provocative questions, and you feel obliged, you know, like uh, uh, the, the question I'm hit with a lot is, uh, why does Wynton Masalas do what he does? And so somebody, somebody's trying to get me to knock Wynton for some reason or other. And, and, <laughs> and so, uh, 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 and I know it's coming, so, so I said, well, you know, well, let me tell you about Wynton. He's a very uh, um, uh, special guy, and uh, I remember when I was talking to his father, and then I'll go up somewhere else, and, and because uh, uh, you, you are the person that is, is going to get uh, uh, be quoted, and uh, you, the last thing you want to do is be misquoted, uh, 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 and you have to be very careful how you say things. Even when you're careful, you're sometimes misquoted. Uh, in the uh, Jazz Times on uh, uh, um, Monk, they did an issue on Monk. And I was asked a question, which I answered uh, very correctly from my perspective. Uh, and the person that asked uh, me to say something about Monk, I said, Monk said to me, uh, I heard him, uh, not to me, but I heard him say, uh, let me back up, Coleman Hawkins said, when asked why he hired Monk, he said, I hired Monk because he does what I want him to do. Uh, to do, He plays himself. Now, that's the quote. He does what I want him to do. He plays himself. The quote that was printed was uh, Billy Taylor said that, that uh, quoted Coleman Hawkins as, as saying, Monk does what I want him to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's correct. I said that. You know? But that's not, you know. And, and so uh, uh, the, the, and, and this, a lot of times, it is not the, the editor. This, this, this may happen quite accidentally. It was, might have been accidentally, accidentally cut off. But then I have to take the fall, because my name is on it. You know? So be careful of what you say, how you say things, and, and make sure that it is directed. You're there to promote your great music and your great group, and uh, you're particularly fond of the drummer who can do all of these marvelous things, and so on, so on, so So say that. I mean, at every chance you get, if that's what you're promoting. Uh, go with an agenda. Whenever, when you, and whenever you're promoting yourself, uh, you can do it. You can be your most uh, uh, 
your best salesman because nobody knows your music better than you do. And so you can say, this is what's great. Uh, be prepared when someone asks you, which of these cuts should I play? Number two, that's the one I, you know, whatever it is. Uh, uh, or whatever it is that's special about, about uh, and this is something everybody has. What is special about your playing? This is not the time to be modest. I mean, that, you know, I mean, I mean say, well, I, you know, you, know, say, uh -uh. you say, well, I, hey, man, I got a left hand you wouldn't believe, you know, I mean, it's whatever, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So whatever uh, helps really uh, sell yourself. Now you know yourself. Uh, if you're trying to get a gig, I mean, you know how to present your best face to the person you're trying to get the gig. Okay, do that especially when you're being interviewed, because that is going to by by uh, a roundabout route is going to help you get the gig. Another thing about um, uh, being interviewed is you always try and continually refocus no matter what the interviewer is trying to steer you towards. As Billy said, you want to just remember why you're there and the points that you want to make. Don't get too involved. Just remember, you know, I want to make these three major points about my new CD or my gig or me or whatever. And try and continually refocus on that. The second thing is never, try never to say anything negative that could be misconstrued and certainly not in print. It's for some reason when, when well. something <laughs> is negative forever. in print, it, it lives a, a life of its own for, for, forever. So you really want to be careful and try and continually be a positive voice as opposed to even if an interviewer want, is trying to bait you and, and get you to say something so that they'll have a controversial show. You need to be aware that there are interviewers out there who will do those things and be prepared in advance. I'm, I, as, a print, as a print journalist, I take what you said very well. Because don't ever say anything. I mean, part of my ability to interview is to get people to relax and reveal things to me that they've never told anyone else. And, I, and, I, and on occasion, I've done that. I've gotten really good material that's, ne that's never been in print before. That is my challenge. That is my goal. So I'm going to ask you provocative questions and try to get you to reveal part of you that's never been revealed before. <laughs> and I, thinking about that, there was a, one of my friends was, was a poet in Cleveland, and she was being interviewed with two other poets, and they're, they're by this print journals for the, for the plain dealer, and they started talking about their wild days. <laughs> And it got into print, and it was so embarrassing. It was so embarrassing that this woman wouldn't go to church for the next, I don't know how many months, because this, this, this got into print. So you really, really need to, to use, I mean, reveal a little bit of yourself and try to answer the interviewer's questions. But don't reveal anything that you would find embarrassing if you saw it in print. For, yeah. for yourself. Nothing is ever off the record. Right. That's and right. and another, thing I wanted, <laughs> another thing I wanted to mention, as far as uh, doing free gigs, man, I don't want anybody to give away their time for nothing. But consider the return on your investment. For example, I write, uh, one of the publications that I write for, I don't get paid, okay? But I know that that publisher sends those CD reviews to every label that, I, that I'm doing. And those end up in press kits that go all around the country. I couldn't buy that kind of publicity as a journalist to get my name out there. I'm in the same boat as you. I'm trying to get my name out there. And as a result of writing for this free publication, I've gotten liner notes. I've gotten paying jobs to write liner notes. So, so you know, consider when you're doing something for free, what is the return on the investment? If you're, if you're playing for a benefit, ask. Is, there gonna, is your publicist going to mention the band name in the publicity, you know? Um, is, are you inviting the television stations there to, to film us? I mean, I'll, I'll be watching some kind of benefit thing on local TV, and I'll see the band playing in the, mu in the background. I mean, they don't mention the musician's name, but there you've got that little glimpse, <laughs> you know? Right. So those are way, way that against uh, things. And also, there are excellent books out there for for publicity for jazz musicians. Uh, you know, go to your local library or you know, bookstore and, and check them out. Um, they're, 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 they give good advice and they're, well, they're generally well written. That's you know, where I 
got a lot of my information because I do publicity as well. And I, I want to mention one more thing. An article I did, I did, a, I did a short piece for Jazz Times on this artist up in Michigan, this jazz uh, pianist. And um, that piece ran, and about a month later, I got a call from an, um, an AP reporter who was writing about this artist. He, he picked up on that story. So one thing can lead to another. So getting your name into print, what Evelyn mentioned about re thinking regionally, not you know, beyond the focus of your, your town or city, uh, is, a good, is good advice. Yes? I just wanted to mention another good venue for placing things and even getting interviews is the airline magazines. Absolutely. Because the airline, mag people read those, they have time, they're three hours on a plane and they want to do something and they see a story, it's a really good, place and also the museums have a lot of spaces for the concerts and the other thing is to follow up with phone calls like if you it, it may sound overwhelming to develop this press list but as you develop it and then if you have a fax at work you can program the numbers in or if you have one at home then you can send out your fax instantly it's much faster than a mailing it and then you follow up with a phone call and I know I've had in the hook thing I've had several things where we were doing something in the schools and I, I sent something to BET, and, and then I called. Uh, he said, why, why would I want to cover this? I said, because it's all African-American little kids who are going to be doing this activity in the school of Southeast. And they were out there for three hours. They came out and filmed it all. You know, it just depends if you can tell them what the hook is. And then, for example, I did something, you know, Jerry Phillips' show, the community radio. We had this choir that I'm with that performed here at the Free Series and, and also with the symphony, and we wanted some coverage. And their rule says you can't, don't even send in a press release for three weeks if you're not three weeks in advance. Well, it was Wednesday before the Sunday of the concert or something. So I said, I still want, we've done so much work on this concert, I still want someone to cover this. So I sent the facts to, I called him up, left a message on his voicemail, then he, he called back, I sent him the information. He said, you know, I want to do this. I don't have anything on black history this month. It's the last Sunday of the month. We were on, t we were on the radio Sunday in three days. I mean, me and the conductor. So it was just like, you don't listen to what people say. You just have to be <laughs> persistent, and you have to make that personal contact. Well. Yeah. yeah, Andrew? Yeah. Uh, yeah, first I want to apologize. I didn't answer your question the last time. I, I, yeah. Uh, but I just, uh, you asked me to say something about the individual experience. And all. Uh, my company is Andrew, my name is Andrew White, and my company is Andrew's Musical Enterprises Incorporated. And uh, I've been in business 25 years. We're having a year-long celebration now, 25 years in business. In terms of performers who are interested in self-producing themselves, the main thing I want to say is that you must do a strong market definition research, in, not only into the, the audience who might be slated for your product, but for yourself as to determine whether or not you want to take this on yourself. It's very difficult work. I have no complaints. I'm very happy, very gratified. I've had tremendous success with it. But I do it full time, and this is all inclusive of my performances as well as sitting behind the desk all the time. Mm -hmm. But you, you really have to make a decision as to whether or not you want to do this because it's very, very difficult, and, and the, the financial risk is, is very high, and the, the attrition rate is very high. I think most self-producers uh, have at least uh, between six to 18 months, and then that's the end of it, uh, on top of losing all the money. So just make sure <laughs> you, you decide what you want to do before you do anything. Make sure you make the decision of whether you want to deal on an industrial level, a local level, international, national, whatever. But try to figure this out before you make any move, because the thing can fall right in your lap at any time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. you. You've been a, a very fine amazing? audience. I hope that we've been able to uh, stimulate your thinking uh, to the extent that it's going to be useful in your particular personal careers, in the approach that, that you as individuals take uh, to so many hands went up when we asked how many performers. So, so many of you are, are uh, talking about yourself and about your career, and there's nothing more important to you at this point than that, and you should focus on the direction that you want it to go in and what is serving your purpose. Uh, several people have said in different ways, uh, uh, don't be dissuaded by people say, this can't be done or you can't do this. Uh, th that does, that's not relevant to, to anything that we're talking about. Anything is possible. There are uh, all of the, 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 whether you're talking about computers, whether you're talking about the, the net, what it, whatever you uh, 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 want to use in terms of the modern technology, uh, see how that works for you. I mean, see how the, the, the uh, being uh, on somebody's web page 
can help you, whether you need to have your own web page. Uh, uh, take in stock all of the existing uh, um, organizations, the jazz uh, um, organizations. There are something, I think, uh, about 500 of them uh, uh, around the country. There's one in, is there one in Washington, D.C.? I don't know. There's one in Richmond, I know. Uh, but, but the jazz uh, um, uh, organizations put on programs. I mean, they, the left bank or in, in, in Baltimore, uh, um, uh, Baltimore. Baltimore uh, put, puts on, on specific programs. Charlotte Jazz uh, Society here in, New York, uh, in Washington, D.C. puts on particular programs. Mm -hmm. So if you know in your area that there are organizations like this, get to know those folks and, and uh, get them to believe in, in what you do and have them present you. I mean, they, there can't be that many people available to them that they can afford to ignore someone who comes and says, look, I want to... Uh, 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 perform in the context of your Ellington present presentation or your Charlie Parker pre presentation or whatever it is, or your John Coltrane uh, 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 presentation. They all have these the things that, that they're particularly interested in. And if that falls within the category of what you do, then say, hey, uh, you know, you don't have any women doing this. I mean, you've got all the guys playing John Coltrane. I can play John Coltrane too, you know, or whatever. And so whatever it, it is uh, 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 that's going to help your uh, direction. Now, most of us realize that the only reason BET is on anything is because they've, uh, a lot of us have said, we want a jazz uh, station uh, uh, represented on television. Now, if BET and other stations are not doing Bravo or any of the others, are not doing enough jazz, then we as individuals need to, to write to, to them and apprise them of that fact. Uh, we're talking about smooth jazz, uh, we need to, uh, make sure that the music business in general uh, labels it as what it is. It's popular music. It is not jazz. And, we, and we, uh, if we don't say that, then nobody's going to say it. And I have no problem with the people who do that. I mean, uh, the Rick, uh, uh, um, um, oh, saxophone player with, with uh, um, uh, the first group, the uh, first big band. Uh, Maria Schneider. With, with Maria Schneider's band. Rick uh, Margitza. Rick, Rick, Rick Margitza. Uh, has some smooth jazz records. He's a great saxophone player. I mean, he can play that. He can play a lot of other. There are several uh, uh, good saxophone players who, for whatever reason, have uh, uh, done those kinds of things. I separate them and that part of their work from uh, the things that he was doing. He sounded great with, with Maria. And he sounded great with a lot of groups that I've heard him with in the New York area. Uh, so uh, the, what the business is doing is making uh, um, uh, uh, lines fuzzy, which makes it very, very difficult for someone who wants to play in either style to, to, to get over. I mean, you can't get over it. Uh, uh, as long as you've got uh, Kenny G uh, on the top of the jazz charts, then where's Phil Woods going to be? Or where's Andrew White going to be? Or where's anybody who's trying to play something that, that is substantial, you know? So uh, it, it's up to us to, 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 to uh, uh, say, and say loudly and clearly at every chance we get, that is not jazz. In my opinion, jazz <laughs> is, whatever you think it is. You know? Thank you very much. You've been a very <laughs> receptive audience.